Okay, so uh, what I want to uh, target tonight is um, some things that I, I mentioned on Sunday that I wanted, I wanted to go more in depth on, on what's currently going on with the Biden administration and the Israeli government. And, and really, I've entitled it, you know, Israel's new enemy, the Biden administration, and other anti-Semitic ilk. And we're going to look at this. And I think this is something we need to understand what's going on, uh, not only in our country, but around the world and where all of this is going, obviously. So Pew Research comes out, says 49% of U.S. Muslims in the United States believe that Hamas' reasoning for, feed, uh, for fighting uh, were valid. So um, that's a problem because we've imported people into our country that don't hold our values and that are anti-Semitic and almost 50% of them believe Hamas was in the right well, that's a problem, uh, with, and I'm sorry, but and this has been the problem, like in the colleges and universities, um, that, and I, know I listened to, to Victor Davis Hanson talk about this, because he's really good on, on what's going on in the colleges, and he said, look, the, the universities and colleges have been importing Muslim students from the Middle East for a very long time, okay? And, 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 and what's happened is they, pull, they pay the full tuition, so, like, if it's $90,000, they pay $90,000, okay? And then you have these endowments and these grants coming from Muslim countries in the Middle East to the colleges and universities. And right now, you know, you start realizing, wait a second, that's why these colleges and universities are not saying anything against, like, these people calling for the genocide of Jews because they're being paid off and... and you know, and I was listening to Victor say this. He said, the colleges and universities are nowhere near saying we're going to expel these kids for that. They're not even, going to, they're not even getting close to that. Now, if you're at Hillsdale, uh, yeah, the Hills, the Hillsdale will do it. I get that, but they usually wouldn't allow someone to go in there that's like that mindset. But anyway, if you're at Harvard and you say death to Israel and death to the Jews, you're not going anywhere if you're coming from the Middle East and you're being paid by, your tuition's being paid by Bahrain or United Arab Emirates or whatever. And they're not doing that. They're not expelling these kids. Now, that would be the logical thing is you're expelled, and if these kids are from the Middle East, then their visa would run out, and then they would have to go back, Right? But, you know, they're not going to say deport them. So they don't have enough guts to do that, and they're, they're not, they're not going to cut themselves off from the money. So we have a problem, obviously. Then, you know, in Britain, uh, they obviously, this has been the, the great replacement over there. This is the Henry Jackson Society. Found 46% of British Muslims are sympathetic towards Hamas. Okay, so almost similar numbers, okay? So we've got a problem on both fronts in the Western world. So we have a problem in the population, then we have a problem in the Biden White House. And obviously the radical left wing has caused a lot of problems. So Biden says that Netanyahu was making a mistake in his handling of the war, okay? So all of a sudden, Israel is the bad guy, and the Biden administration has done a turnabout on them since last Thursday, okay? So something's changed, something dramatically has changed with the Biden White House, that now, now they're saying things openly, okay, against Netanyahu. And, and basically, you know, this undercuts Israel's negotiations with Hamas, obviously. It allows Hamas to win, uh, you know, because if, if, the Biden administration wants a ceasefire. You know, and that, a ceasefire allows Hamas to win, basically, right? Um, and does it for, force Hamas to release the, the hostages? So, like yesterday, I was talking to the two IDF soldiers, and they're like, yeah, we're, we're going to go totally in and, and we're going to eliminate Hamas. That, we know that. We, that's part of the strategic plan. And that's what we're going to do. And then after that, we're going to the north and take care of Hezbollah. Like, it, it, like we have already have a strategy for that. It, we're not stopping. So you've you got you to gotta understand from Israel's standpoint and, and talking to the IDF, they're going all in. They're going to kill all of Hamas, which they should. But you got the Biden administration doing all, pulling all kinds of stuff. Okay, so what kinds of stuff are they pulling? Well, the new narrative now from the, uh, the left in Israel and what the Biden administration is using is the narrative of the hostages. Okay? So they're using this in a political ploy. And we obviously know, what, there's 134 hostages, and there's American hostages, right? 
And how come the Biden administration has never said anything about the American hostages? Hey, we're going to send Na the, the Navy SEALs in there to extract them. We're not putting up with this. No American's going to be taken hostage like that. We're going to send our Delta Force in and take care of business. How come we have never said that? How come we don't do that? You know the answer. So here's, here's the Biden administration saying that, well, we want to cease fire because we want humanitarian aid to go in there to the Gaza. Well, that's a lie. Humanitarian aid has been moving in there. In fact, what we see is record numbers of aid trucks have went into Gaza even this last Sunday. And again on Monday, okay, it reached to 419 trucks, right? Prior to the war, 70 food trucks entered Gaza daily, daily from Israel, okay? So Israel's basically feeding these people. And they continue to feed them during the war. They haven't cut the food off. So I don't know who is, who's out there telling them that, that food got cut off. It's a lie. Okay, so Jake Sullivan said it wasn't good enough. Okay, well, much of the aid is coming from the UN is stolen by Hamas. That UN brings in there, Hamas takes it and steals it and then sells it. That we know that. Does the Biden administration know this? Yes, they do. Oh, oh, okay, so what are they up to? Okay, here's another thing. Senior Biden Treasury official admits money for Iran goes towards violence, not humanitarian needs. So basically, the $6 billion that Biden administration unfroze for Iran last year in exchange for the return of five American prisoners went to f likely to fund violent activity instead of humanitarian aid, as Biden administration indicated. Now, here's um, this. I can't remember what position he has. Um, ah, he's, anyway, he's in the administration. And he told the truth about in, 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 in front of uh, Congress. So listen to him. So Senator, you're right that in a democracy, money is fungible. But what we've seen time and ta time from the Iranian regime is they fail to feed their people and they put the IRGC first. Any dollar they have will go towards their violent activity before they deal with their people. That's partially why almost none of the humanitarian money has been used for humanitarian purposes because they don't care about getting drugs and food for their people. But the difference is that the United States of America has made as a values proposition that we are always going to provide humanitarian relief for people. And that's what we've said is the only purpose for this money. So while in our country money is fungible, in Iran they've proven that any dollar they get that they have direct access to in the country will be used for the IRGC before it's ever used yeah. for their people. So, he's fired tomorrow, probably, okay? Okay, he's fired. They're going to fire him, but he told the truth. And he's like, what, 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 you know, any money we give to these creeps, the, the, it's not going to humanitarian aid, and, and neither does it when it goes to Hamas, okay? It doesn't, okay? And we already know the money that we, we, the United States has sent to Hamas or the Palestinian Authority doesn't go to the people. We know that. Israel tells us, and we know it on the ground. So, there's a lot of lying going on. Okay, and again, I'm, I'm hitting on both fronts. I'm hitting the Biden administration, and, and I'm hitting our culture. So the Super Bowl, this came out just recently this week. The uh, Super Bowl had an ad, obviously, uh, that, was, that was developed by Israel, and it drew the most complaints on the Super Bowl. It was an Israeli-funded Super Bowl ad calling for the return of the fathers captured by Hamas in their October 7th attack. It drew the most complaints now, again, what am I telling you? I'm showing you what has happened to our culture, okay? That the most complaints the Super Bowl had was over the Israeli commercial, and it was just simply bring back our fathers. That draws the complaints? Yeah, that draws the complaints. You think the Biden administration is paying attention to that? You think the Biden administration is paying the Michigan, uh, paying attention to them in Minnesota, where all these Muslim voters are? Yes, they are, because it's an election year, Okay. Then you, this is Dearborn, Michigan, which is Dearbornistan, okay? It's not America, it's Dearbornistan, okay? Anti-Israeli processors in Dearborn, Michigan closed out Ramadan by chanting death to America, death to Israel during an international day of Al-Quds Day rally. By the way, that's the Muslim's term for Jerusalem. Jerusalem is Jerusalem, it's not Al-Quds, uh, but that's what they call it. But listen to this, this is in America, okay? We have imported this. And I want you to listen to the, what kind of individual we have imported. We've been asked in the past, why are our protests on the International Day of Quds, why are Jerusalem. they so anti-America? Why don't we just focus more on Israel and not talk so much about America? 
Gaza has shown the entire world why these protests are so anti-America. Because it's the United States government that provides the funds for all of the atrocities that we just heard about. And this is why Imam Khomeini, who declared the International Day of Quds, this is why he would say to pour all of, your all of your chants and all of your shouts upon the head of America. Malcolm X said, and I quote, we live in one of the rottenest countries that, have ever, that has ever existed on this earth. It's not Genocide Joe that has to go. It's the entire system that has to go. Any system that would allow such atrocities and such devilry to, a ha to happen and would support it, such a system does not deserve to exist on God's earth. And so when these fools ask us if Israel has the right to exist, the chant death to Israel has become the most logical chant shouted across the world today. Imam Khomeini recognized that Israel is an evil settler colonialist project. He realized it is a cancer and he established this day. Israel before this, brothers and sisters, was a sacred cow. Nobody could criticize Israel. Everybody was terrified of being anti-Semitic. Everybody was afraid of them. But now, the people of conscience very openly will criticize Israel. They recognize Israel for what it is. Israel is ISIS. Israel are, they are Nazis. They are fascists. They are racist. The people of the world now know this. Can you say free Palestine? Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! From the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. So that's in Dearborn, Michigan. And, and here's the interesting thing that we got people that come from the Middle East, Muslims that come into our country and hate our way of life. They hate what we stand for, they hate our system. I want to know why do they stay here then? Go back to Saudi Arabia, go back to Jordan, go back to Iran or wherever you came from if this is such a rotten place. Why do you stay here? Get out, get out for these people, man. I, I can't take it anymore. I, I don't understand people who move to the United States and hate our country. I don't get it. I don't get it. But we, we're bringing them in by the droves, okay? So let, just to understand that these, these people are demonic. The, 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 look, if you're not understanding that Muslim, Islam is the problem, you're not getting it, okay? Islam is a religion. A, a, it's a satanic religion. I'm sorry. It is what it is. And, and, and it, so why, why do we import this? Okay, so what is Israel doing? Well, they're going to go into Rafah. That's no doubt. Okay, but what are they doing? This is how kind they are. They're, they're purchasing 40,000 tents. Why? To prepare for the evacuation of the, of the Palestinian civilians that they can stay in while they go in and take Hamas out. Who does this? Who does this? This is the most moral army you'll ever see on the planet. I mean, I was talking to the IDF commanders. We were saying it on the air uh, yesterday. Hey, man, we're the only uh, uh, moral people that we, we, we not only send leaflets and we call them and text them, but even before we shoot a rocket into a building, we warn the people in the building, and we send like a, 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 a warning shot. We'll send a rocket to a building that does minimal damage to warn them, and then the big one will come behind it. Who does that? Who does that other than Israel, right? So they're getting 40,000 tents. They're, 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 they're going to make provision for these civilians. It's not like they're throwing them out on the street. What do we have in Rafah? About four Hamas battalions are believed to be stationed there. Israel said that without launching an offensive in Rafah, it won't be able to achieve its goals laid out in the start of the war. Rafah is also thought to be where Hamas leaders are hidden, possibly along with the Israeli hostage. So they have to. It's a non-negotiable non thing. You have to go in there. Well, the Biden administration says, we're going to change all that. Yeah. And again, Israel has said it's going to plan to evacuate the civilians before the offensive. Before the offensive. Who does that? Who does that? Now, the funny thing is, I saw in the news where uh, I, I was Blinken or, or Kirby was being questioned by Ducey, and, and there was like, you know, you, you guys get all mad about Israel killing 
accidentally uh, seven civilians or whatever from the UN or whatever kitchen, whatever it was. And those are civilian casualties, and civilian casualties happen in war. I don't know any other war that doesn't have civilian casualties. But just in 2021, the United States bombed someplace in Afghanistan, and there was babies and children killed, and there was no war crimes being thought of, of us killing civilians, because that's just war, right? But yet Israel kills seven accidentally, not on purpose, in a war zone, and so the people that went in there knew they were in a war zone, and they get killed, but yet Israel is to blame, and they're committing gen genocide and atrocities and war crimes. Um, how come we don't get war crimes when we kill innocent civilians? The same, right? And so when Ducey questioned Kirby or, or Blinken, one of the two goofballs, um, they didn't know how to answer. They were like, well, it's one or the other. You know, it's two different things. No, it's not. You have civilian casualties. And again, I don't know, and you can quote me, uh, I'm sorry, quote, give me the, the facts if you know any war that didn't kill civilians in the war zone. I, I, I've yet to find anything in history where civilians were not killed accidentally. No one intends to do that, right? It's crazy. Okay. So what the U.S. now has pivoted, and you have to understand this, is it's trying to oust Netanyahu. That's what they're trying to get rid of because he's not going with the flow. He's not playing ball. And again, Netanyahu is looking at his polling numbers from the Israeli citizens and his polling like 75 to 80% want them to wipe out Hamas and do not want a Palestinian state. So what is he supposed to do? Go against his own people? Right, so he's going to do what he's going to do, right? So the Biden administration, well, that doesn't fit into our plan. So they are now pushing to get him out of there. And that has now leaked out that, that that's the United States' plans. Okay? So check, check this out. So 81% of Israelis, including Arab Israelis, say there's no prospect for peace with the Palestinians, including 70% of left-wing voters. That's left-wing. Okay? So it seems like you, Israel's pretty unified on this, right? So 88% of the Israelis do not trust the Palestinian leadership. That's saying a lot. 88% polling left and right? Okay. Three senior U.S. officials say that Biden administration is looking past Netanyahu to try to achieve its goals in the region. Several senior U.S. officials told NBC News that Netanyahu will not be there forever. Mitchell wrote, the Biden administration is trying to lay the groundwork for other Israeli and civil society leaders in anticipation of an eventual post-Netanyahu government. In an attempt to work around Netanyahu during the, his visit to Israel, Blinken also met individually with members of his war cabinet and other Israeli leaders, including opposition leader Yair Lapid. Okay, you don't do that. You meet with the head. You meet with Netanyahu. He's the prime minister. No one else is the prime minister. But yet Blinken was doing this. And we brought, uh, the United States brought over uh, uh, Gantz um, over as well and talked to him and, and basically read him the riot act because he's not cooperating with us, apparently. When I say us, I mean the Biden administration. Uh, and so they tried to dress him down and say, look, you need to cooperate. Okay, so Blinken then tried to compel Netanyahu to agree to the plan that would see the U.S.-supported Fatah-controlled Palestinian Authority. Okay, that's what they're wanting. That's crazy. We're, that means we go back to the same thing, right? And then Blinken insists that, insists that Israel cannot win a military victory in Gaza. As Mitchell put it, Blinken told Netanyahu that ultimately there's no military solution for, to Hamas. What? And that the Israeli leader needs to recognize that or history will repeat itself and violence will continue. No, no, the violence will continue, Blinken, if you let Hamas live. They all have to be eliminated. Do you not rem remember what happened on October 7th? What are you guys trying to do? Uh, well, I know it's a, an election year. I get that. I get that. And they're, they're trying to prevent a regional war over there because you don't want to go on November 1st and have a regional war in the Middle East because of Biden's incompetency. Um, and you don't want to have your gas prices at $6 uh, a gallon at November 1st because you'll lose the election. So I get that. But a lot of this stuff of like regime change stuff, that's not good. And that's what we're starting to see. So here's, here's the other side, too, in Israel. So you've got to understand, in Israel, there are people undercutting Netanyahu, undercutting the, the duly elected government of Israel, okay? And these guys are no good, okay? Let me tell you something about the general staff uh, of the IDF. 
The soldiers we met yesterday are good guys. They have the right intent. They're, they want to destroy Hamas, and they'll fight for their country. But when you get to the general level of Israel, you're dealing with political appointees from the left. Okay? In the IDF, you're not getting to captain, you're not getting to colonel, you're not getting to the general staff unless a leftist politician lets you get up that high, okay? So you, there's no such thing as earning your way through the ranks. You're appointed. And in order to be appointed, you have to march in line with the leftist agenda in Israel, okay? So we got a problem here, don't we? So what I want you to think about is you have the general IDF underneath them that are just great guys. That's who we're supporting, right? Then in the, on top of them is the general staff, and then above them are the politicians like Netanyahu. Okay? Netanyahu and the IDF are on the same page. Okay? But the problem here is in the middle. It's with the generals. It's they're the problem and because they're political appointees. And they're the ones cooperating with the Biden administration to oust Netanyahu. That's what's going on in Israel. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated, evil thing that's going on. So here's one of the guys that are trying to undo what Netanyahu is doing. This is retired General Nimrod Sheffer. Yes, that's right. His name is Nimrod. I, I, look, I, even from a Jewish perspective, you would never name your kid Nimrod because Nimrod's a bad dude, right? You name him Jacob or David or Moses, but Nimrod, this is the name his parents chose? Well, he is a Nimrod, okay? Sorry, but he is a Nimrod. So he, this, I want to show you what this guy's been up to. He's a retired head of the Israeli Defense Forces Planning Division fighter pilot, was one of the most prominent retired generals pushing last year for Netanyahu's ouster during the 10-month-long left-wing insurrection that preceded October 7th. So all last year, this guy was one of the guys behind it. Along with how Levy uh, and the other general, I think, that were part of it and their families were involved in it as well. These are generals, okay? The, the, these generals are the ones who heard the warnings from the lower IDF and refused to listen to them. These are the guys. This guy, was, this is what he was doing. He was leading a campaign to convince active reserve Israeli Air Force pilots who refused to serve in the reserves as long as the government advanced its legislative effort to limit. Uh, where did I go here? To limit, maybe I... Bottom of the page. There we go. <laughs> to serve in the reserves, so I didn't cut that off. Reserve as long as the government advances legislative effort to limit the powers of the Supreme Court. And, and so you remember, remember the whole judicial reform, right? And what happened last year was, and, and, and I know this is Israeli politics, but you got to kind of know a little bit about Israeli politics. So their Supreme Court is off the hinge, right? They're out of control. They're just, they're like, they have the power to, so whatever the legislature produces, and they say, we want to make this a law. They'll just say, no, that's no good. It's not reasonable. So they had a, like a reasonableness clause, which is crazy, right? So the Supreme Court, or a bunch of leftists in Israel, and they basically had the veto power over any legislative bill that was passed or law that was passed. They could say, no, it's not reasonable. And it was like, well, wait a second. That's tyrannical. If the people voted for this and they want this bill and they want this law or whatever, who are you? To come in. It's like when California happened when we voted for no gay marriage and then some single judge overrode the entire vote. That's what was going on in Israel last year. So Netanyahu was going to clean that up and everyone wanted that. That's why he got voted in because they wanted these judges to be reined in. Hey, we can't have judicial activists on the, on the seat, right? So just the same thing we have in America, right? So these leftists, like this guy, was saying, well, don't serve. Don't serve. Don't serve if Netanyahu's in there. And so he had a whole campaign going along with these other guys, right? And, and, and they're leftists, man, hardcore leftists. So they've been undermining Netanyahu until October 7th, and now they're back at it. Okay, 
So the other guys are Yair Lapid, which the, the Biden administration met with, uh, Yoav Gallant, the Chief General Staff, General Hertzi Halivi. Again, Halivi is not a good dude. He's the one who was warned and didn't take action when he was warned with some other generals. And basically, they were all parodying the same messages that, the, that match up with the Biden administration's desire for a two-state solution and to end the war now without getting rid of Hamas and, uh, and, and no, no, no hostage release. So something's going on. It's pretty wicked between the Biden administration and these guys undercutting Netanyahu. Okay. So Caroline Glick, who we're going to interview next week, she had a great article, and she starts saying, look, this is what leaked out. This is what's going on between the Biden administration and these people. First of all, there, last weekend, there was these far-left government, you know, anti-government riots uh, that was happening all through 20, 20, uh, 2023. So they had four days of protest last Sunday, uh, Saturday, sorry, and they had bonfires, traffic, uh, you know, uh, uh, stopped traffic arteries, assaults on police, assaults on ultra-Orthodox Jews, threats to murder Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Hmm, that sounds interesting because they're probably going to do the same thing to Trump, right? So whatever you see in Israel typically mirrors what's going on in America. Funny how that works out. Storming police barricades, pr pr protecting Netanyahu's home, right? And, and again, what were they doing before October 7th? Demanding the overthrow of the government as anti-democratic and corrupt and yada, yada, yada. So they, they started back again. Okay, so here's what Glick reveals. This dude spilled the beans. This is riot leader Ami Duror. He's a very, uh, like I said, he's like a millionaire type of guy, right? So this guy doesn't work, and so he spends his days rioting and going against Netanyahu. Well, he revealed on March 17th on WhatsApp group chat with his colleagues that the White House was asking them to reinstate riots. And remember, the riots are anti-Netanyahu, anti-government, right? So he's, he's leaking this, right? So this communication was authentic in an interview Dror had with Channel 14 in Israel and was the first reported by X, formerly known as Twitter, by a poster who, op uh, poster who operates under the handle Arbelu the Tuna Hunter. Okay? So again, it's, it's, he's confirming it, basically. So what happened? So this guy spills the beans. It's like a Scooby-Doo cartoon, right? The, the evil villain tells you what they're going to do. I don't know if this is a spiritual truth, but here's what happened. There's a four-part plan that the White House has to overthrow the Netanyahu government. Wait a second. I thought it was illegal to do regime change. I thought that we, we don't do that. But apparently we do. But, so, yeah. The components involved actions on the ground in Gaza, obviously. The use of the UN Security Council. Extortion of government ministers, I'll explain that, and mass protests. So that's the fourfold way they want to get Netanyahu out of there. Okay, so let's, let's unpack this a little bit. So the new slogan, these anti-Netanyahu government people in Israel are protesting, their new slogan is, um, is using the hostages as the slogan. Okay? So th th their, their thing is the most urgent task is to return the hostages and... And the way to return the hostages is by replacing the government, which means setting a date for elections now. You see what's going on? So they're saying, we, we've got to set election dates because we've got to get these hostages. Netanyahu's not going to get the hostages. And so we've got to get the hostages back. So they're, they're politicizing the hostages, which is typical of the left, right? They politicize everything, right? Um, and so... They're saying, we got to have new elections. We're going to get these hostages out. we got to have them. And then they interviewed about 10 families from the hostages that are f apparently far left, that don't care uh, uh, that, the, the, that Hamas has to be eliminated. And they, 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 they used them as a talking point for all the other families. Well, that's only about 10 of the families that are far left. The other families are like, no, no. You go in and destroy Hamas, then you get my kid out. They're all on the same ticket, except these 10 family members are, are, are 10 families uh, that are far left wing anyway. So anyway, that's the talking point that the Biden administration wants them to use. So this is what he said. The American plan, as I published it on March 6th, remains unchanged. 
The day after my publication, the Biden administration announced the establishment of an American port in Gaza that will, that, that, that will seize from Israel the ability to rule the Strip. The port will be used initially to provide food, but the central purpose of the port is to rebuild Gaza. So there, the United States is saying, we're going to put a port there in Gaza. We're going to use it, not you. Huh. The purpose of the U.S. campaign for humanitarian aid, he explained, was twofold. I thought it was for helping people. It was undermining the control of the Israeli defense forces in Gaza and blackmailing government ministers. Well, what do you mean? Well, what the plan is, is to tell them they are committing war crimes by not getting food into the Gaza. So they're threatening all the Israeli government saying, when this is all said and done, we're going to accuse you all of war crimes. Because you didn't let the food in. When, you know good and well, I just showed you they're letting the food in. There's 400 and something trucks that went in last Sunday. And they're going to say, no, no, we're going to charge all of you on war crimes unless you get rid of Netanyahu. Blackmail. Did you catch that? You mu it, we will all let you off the hook if you get rid of Netanyahu. That's called political blackmail. That's what they're doing to the government ministers right now as we speak. They're telling them, we're going we're gonna to charge you with this, war crimes. It'll be Nuremberg all over again. You want that? So they're threatening them. In his words, government ministers are receiving messages from American friends that they will be accused of war crimes. Under our radar, the U.S. and the EU have framed the hunger in northern Gaza as a war crime. This is the excuse for seizing control over the territory from Israel, parachuting food continuously, including by the German military, and building a port. But the words potential indictment for all members of the government of the destruction is the clincher. They will turn members of the Israeli government into wanted criminals guilty of war crimes. That's what the Biden administration and the EU is doing. I'm telling you, man, this is, this is evil. This is evil. And what, let me ask you this. What do you think? If you're in one of the cabinet positions in the Netanyahu government, and you're being told that the United States and the EU are going to bring war crimes against you if you stay in that position and keep supporting Netanyahu in that government, what do you think they're going to do? I, you know, again, some of them maybe have the strength and the courage to say, forget you, we're going to do what's right for our country. But could they possibly buy off anybody with extortion like that? I don't know. Maybe. They're, they're certainly using it. I'm telling you, man, when I say we're going to be judged for this, the Biden administration is the prime example of who's bringing the judgment to us. It's what they're doing. This, this is big. This is evil, right? Tampering with someone's, you know, democracy or whatever, or parliament, whatever you want to call it. I thought we didn't do that. Hmm. So let's go, let's go to the UN Security Council. Remember, it's a fourfold plan. We're going to indict them on war crimes. Number two, we're going to get the UN involved. So the United States intends to pass a resolution in the, United, in the UN Security Council that calls for immediate ceasefire in the Gaza. Okay? Now, we already know they sat it out. They could have vetoed the last one, but they didn't. So they sat it out. But he's talking, to, uh, he's talking about another one that they're going to do. The draft resolution was already published, and it is being used as a means to pressure the government to prevent it from undermining a hostage deal, basically on Hamas's terms. If Netanyahu agrees to the deal, which effectively involves strategic defeat in the war, um, Ben uh, uh, Gavir, he's the national security minister, has to leave the government. If he doesn't, he will lose most of his support, supporters. In this case, the government will survive and be dependent on Benny Gantz, who they already brought over all alone, and Gideon Saar. And it will be easy to expand the government to include Yair Lapid and Avador Lieberman. These are all leftists, by the way. And so transform it into a government controlled by the political left. This is the administration's preferred option. The Biden administration's preferred option. These are the guys that they want to get in there. And they're working to do this as we speak, okay? If Netanyahu rejects the hostage deal in the next 10 days, and we're, not, we're talking like this month, 
Okay, the Security Council will approve the U.S. draft, or even worse, a different draft. The U.S. will not veto requiring Israel to accept a ceasefire. And practically speaking, end of the war will bring about the government's overthrow. That's what they're planning. That's what they're doing, okay? President Biden's request from us, that he's, this is talking from the rioter guy. Remember, the, the millionaire guy that's stirring all this pot up, okay? The American method of dealing with misbehaving states includes the destruction, economic and legal, that is centered on the leadership on the one hand and driving a wedge between the nation and the leadership. In our case, for this to work, the nation of Israel must show in the streets that it is fighting the leadership, fighting Netanyahu, in other words. The American administration needs to see the nation in Israel fighting the government of Israel. Okay, so that's, that's what their, their, uh, their plans are for all of this. Okay. I'm telling you, this is evil, and you know it, but then we have all these leftists in government, and, we're, and our country is still becoming more anti-Semitic. So here's this lemma, Elizabeth Warren, and again, you already know where she comes from, but it, it just keeps getting worse. So she goes to an event at an Islamic center at Boston. Okay, I already know if I'm going to that event, that's probably not a good thing, but she goes there, Right? Uh, and told her audience, which is Islamic Center, that's Muslims, what Israel is doing is wrong. It is wrong to starve children with a civilian population in order to try to bend it to her, your will. Well, that's not what's happening, Elizabeth. That's, that's a lie. That's not what's happening. I just showed you the aid trucks that are going in there. And the tents. I believe that they'll find that, this, that it is genocide. And they, the International Court of Justice, have ample evidence to do so. And again, maybe she's, she's spouting off at the mouth being an idiot like she is, or, or maybe she has the talking points already with, from the Biden administration, and everyone's on the same ticket. Because, you know, it's funny that they all get the memo. They all say the same thing, you know. Okay, furthermore, what's starting to happen, too, so we, that's the Biden administration, but, like, again, culturally, stuff is degrading. So we're watching people that we used to hold in high esteem now fall because of Israel. So Tucker Carlson's the next one to go that, look, I've given him plenty of chances to see if he would come around. He's not coming around. He went full blown. Okay? And so the, the you know, Israeli news, it's official, Tucker Carlson, anti-Semite. And let me explain what they're trying. Okay, we already had an issue with him and Candace Owens getting onto Israel, right? And, you, and people were saying, well, he's just an isolationist. Maybe not. Um, and, and so the article goes on for a long time. Many have tried to give the benefit of the doubt. Tucker Carlson isn't anti semitic He's just an isolation. But at this point, it's undeniable. Tucker possesses a special hatred for Jews and Jewish state. Back in December, Tucker said that Ben Shapiro of the Daily Wire doesn't care about the country at all, accusing him and other pro-Israel pundits of being focused on the conflict in a foreign country as their own country becomes dangerously unstable. In questioning Shapiro's loyalty to the United States, Tucker relied on the classical anti-Semitic trope of dual loyalty, which is always given to the Jews, implying Jews are traitorous fifth column in a, in a, in a you know, place. Instead of arguing with Shapiro on the merits, he questioned his motivations and loyalty, adopting the tactics of a Nazi and Soviet anti-Semite of earlier generations. So it, it, Tucker didn't do anything different that other generations accused Jews of doing. Okay? So we got that. So then he brings on this idiot, Okay, Pastor Munther Isaac. Okay, now here's the thing. This is how you know he's crossed the line. Tucker Carlson has a research staff that helps him. I don't. But I can find out more about this guy than Tucker Carlson's organization apparently could. So again, I'm not giving them the benefit of the doubt that they didn't do their research. They know who they're putting up there for Cucker to interview. They know. So if I can find this information out, and I don't have a research team, and you can find that information out, how come they didn't find it out? So this little pastor, Munther Isaac, is a complete anti-Semite, off the rails, Christ at the checkpoint type of guy. He is, he is replacement theology, and he's a liar from the pit of hell. Okay, Everybody knows that about this guy. He's a liar from the pit of hell. Any one of you can Google his name and see all the lies he has about Israel. Okay? This guy pretends to be a pastor. He pretends to be a Christian. He's nothing but an apostate. And everyone knows that in the game. Everyone knows that. 
This guy has a horrible reputation. And yet Tucker interviews him and lets him roll. Tucker gave a platform to this guy. He's the conference director of Christ at the Checkpoint. It is the most anti-Semitic thing. It's the most unchristian thing you could ever possibly be involved in, Christ at the Checkpoint. It is unchristian. He is a well-known anti-Israel propagandist from Forum in Bethlehem and seeks to undermine evangelical Christian support for Israel. That's what his intent is. Christ and the Checkpoint advocates are advocate for BDS movement, targeting Israel, denies Jewish people historical connection to Israel by manipulating Christian theology and history, basically lying and creating false theology, vilifies Israel as being solely responsible for all the conflict in the region. That's what kind of guy this guy is, okay? The Chuckers people know that. Of course they did. Christ the Checkpoint promotes a particularly twisted form of anti-Semitic replacement theology that the church has replaced Israel, like I've told you guys about, I've warned you about. At one of his conferences, Naeem Atik explained the name of the group by claiming that Jesus was a Palestinian who lived in Palestine, born under occupation. Jesus lived under occupation. Everything he taught, everything he said was done under occupation, exactly the way we, are, we live today. Though well, that's a lie. Now, you're changing history now, calling Jesus a Palestinian. He's Jewish. How did you miss that one? Oh, because you're a liar and, and you, you serve the father of lies? That's why. Munther, Isaac, celebrated October 7th, declaring in a sermon the next day that he was shocked by the strength of the Palestinian man who defied his siege. You, you, you celebrated the Palestinian man, which is Hamas, who defied his siege? You're saying Israel was sieging them? Yeah, you little devil, you. You little Satan. That's right, you little devil. You liar. That's what this guy is. He's an apostate, right? And Tucker had him on. Does Tucker's team not vet this guy? I mean, you're talking about like on the level of Louis Farrakhan. Are we understanding things here? That's what this guy is. And Tucker puts him on. Claims that Israel's committing genocide in Gaza, starving the Gaza civilian people. And Tucker agreed with him. Here's the thing. Listen to yourself. If, if you wake up in the morning and decide that your Christian faith requires you to support a foreign government blowing up churches and killing Christians... When's that happening? I, I think you've lost the thread. It, it, just to, to end on this, if you had a message for Christian leaders in the United States, whether in government or in churches or just citizens who care about the religion and their fellow Christians, what would it be? It would be to remind them that when the state of Israel was created, it was not created on an empty land. It was created on a land that had uh, millions of indigenous Palestinians there, including Palestinian Christians. And that that state they support, uh, that state they celebrated as a fulfillment of prophecy and a sign of God's state to the Jewish people for it to become a state. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, including Palestinian Christians, uh, were forced to leave and have never returned. Uh, churches were closed. A friend of mine did the research and counted more than 30 churches that were closed when Israel was created because Palestinians uh, were expelled from uh, the land. Our numbers continue to be in decline. Uh, so we're pleading that uh, uh, come and listen, come and talk to us. And my message to Christian leaders right now is there is a very, very brutal war taking place in Gaza, a war that I have described using the word genocide because it's a war that has used even starvation as a mean. And fellow Christians are suffering because of that war. Uh, it's time that uh, Christian leaders uh, recognize that wars is not the way, whether in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya. I mean, when will we learn that war does not help? When will we take Jesus' words seriously uh, about being peacemakers, about being merciful? Merciful. There must be uh, other ways. Uh, and so it would be an invitation to listen, to learn more, uh, and to avoid very shallow and simplistic perspectives that are not based on scripture itself, but more based on uh, political uh, equations. Uh, and I would plea right now, and I will continue to plea that we need to stop this war in Gaza. Uh, it's killing many, many children, women, innocent lives. It has to stop. 
there must be uh, other ways. And as a follower of Christ, uh, we have to pursue the path of peace uh, and justice, and we have to avoid simplistic uh, polarizations, good and evil. Come and listen, come and understand what's happening. And I plead as a Christian pastor from Bethlehem, I plead that you come uh, and listen. Father, thank you for your thoroughly decent and sensible analysis, and I hope it's heard by Christians throughout the West. I appreciate it. No questioning. The guy lied the whole time. He lied the whole time and didn't misuse his scripture. Hey, dude, have you ever read Ecclesiastes chapter 3? There's a time for peace and a time for war. How did you miss that one, dude? Or you wanted to take the Beatitudes, which is only applicable on a person-to-person -person level, not on a national level. Is that what you tried to do? Oh, that's right, because that's a false teacher for you. You take things out of context, don't you? There is time for war. There is a time where you have to deal with people. There is, why did he, God institute capital punishment? Uh, some people have to die for what they do, right? Sorry, we, we have capital punishment. He establishes that with Noah doesn't he? Did he miss that one? Let's do some history. Let's understand a few things, because that was a lying Satan right there in front of you. In 1948, before five Arab armies invaded Israel, there were under a million Arabs living there. No such thing as a Palestinian Christian was living there, like he said. There was no such thing as a Palestinian until 1964 when the term got used as a victim term for a group of displaced Arabs that refused to go back into the land because they wouldn't recognize Israel's statehood. Anyway, Ottoman census records from the 19th century as well as the early 20th century records from the British Foreign Office reveal that a significant number of those who were descendants today call themselves Palestinians are in fact descendants of Arab migrants who came across the then borderless Middle East to Palestine or Israel because of the available work in the growing, developing Jewish settlements. They were not displaced. Furthermore, the majority of these Arabs fled Israel at the behest of the invading Arab armies. It was the Arabs that told them to leave the land. Israel said, stay. We will let you assimilate into our, our land. But they listened to the Arabs, and the Arabs told them, no, we're going to decimate Israel, we're going to destroy Israel, get out of there, and then you can go back. Well, they didn't, and they lost. So they, the, they left because they listened to other Arabs. The Jews told them to stay. While, remaining, while the remaining 150,000 Arabs remained and were granted full Israeli citizenship after the war, just like Israel told them to do. Over the last 75 years, the Arab-Israeli population has grown exponentially to about 2.1 million. So they thrive in Israel. Arab Christians make up about 7% of that number and are among the Israel's most successful minority groups. So I don't know what this guy's talking about. Again, he's lying. Again, look, look at what we even say. Okay? This is our Secretary of Defense. Washington has no evidence that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin testified during a Tuesday hearing of the Senate Armed Services Committee about, two, about, about the 2025 defense budget. That's us saying it. So this, this little Satan over there telling Tucker, so Tucker, are you not going to question him? Are you not going to back him up on his lies? Oh, or maybe because it fits Tucker's narrative. Oh, we've lost another one. Count him down. Genocide? You're talking, this, this little Satan was saying genocide, starvation? U.S. federal law defines geno, uh, genocide as a violent attack with a specific intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. After Hamas terrorists brutally slaughtered over 1,200 innocent civilians and took hundreds of hostages on October 7th, Israel invaded Gaza with the goal of destroying the terrorist group while making great efforts to protect the Gazan civilians. Hamas claims that since the beginning of the war, over 30,000 Gazan civilians have been killed. An estimate of, the, uh, of Colonel John Spencer, chair of Urban Warfare Studies at Modern War Institute, explains it's absurd. 30,000 civilians have not died in Gaza, as a fact, because that number does not account for a single Hamas member. Spencer explains that civilian casualties are abnormally low in the Gaza conflict. The IDF is actually doing this, is the, uh, actually doing this with the least amount of civilian casualties in the history of war. So he's lying. Genocide? Hmm. And what about the uh, Isaac's claim that Israel is starving the Arabs of Gaza? 
Here are some facts. From the beginning of the war through mid-February, 254,000 tons of supplies were transferred to Gaza, including 167,000 tons of food. There are now 42% more food trucks entering Gaza on a daily basis than before October 7th. Yesterday, 468 aid trucks entered Gaza, the highest number of trucks bringing aid since the start of the war. Though allowing aid into Gaza helps Hamas, Israel has nonetheless allowed the delivery of mass amounts of food and supplies to Gaza. There is more than enough aid entering Gaza today to feed the population. If civilians are hungry, it's because Hamas confiscates most of the supplies for themselves. How come that guy doesn't know that? Or let me better yet, how come Tucker doesn't know that? I found this out just simply doing my own research. I don't have a research team, but I can find this. How come they can't? Unless it fits Tucker's narrative. Tucker's no fool. He knows that Munther Isaac is lying. He knows that Israel is not committing genocide and that Hamas uses uh, the Gazans as human shields and responsible for civilian deaths. He's right. Why then did he give his seal of approval to Munther Isaac's lie in front of millions of users? Seven million people watched it. Why promote a known charlatan who has dedicated his life to undermining Israel. Why did he do that? The answer is unavoidable because Tucker Carlson is an anti-Semite and his goal is to turn Christians against the Jewish state. That's the only thing you can conclude, unless Tucker's on dope. Maybe, maybe he was high when he did the interview. Okay, maybe he was high. We've seen Tucker like this before. Jew, hater, Jew haters who feign righteousness while slandering God's people. Your tongue plots destruction as a sharpened razor working deceit. You loved evil more than good, falsehood more than speaking righteous forever. People like Tucker may be popular for a while, 